Hi oh guys, so here I am sitting in my living room on my comfy chair, all kicked back. And I want to start by talking a little bit about this whole fictitious force, inertial force thing. So, centrifugal force, Coriolis force, is it real? And there's a serious semantic issue associated with all of this. What is a real force? So, to be clear, um, I want to distinguish what Taylor calls an inertial force and and then I don't know what the right name for the other force is. So for the lack of, all right, I'm tempted to call it a real force, but I won't. Let's call it an interaction force. Because uh, you remember the title of your textbook for Physics 151, Matter and Interactions. Forces arise from interactions. So gravity, interaction between you and the Earth, uh, say, or the Earth and the Sun. Uh, the force of you pushing on the box. Well, in the classical view, it's the interaction of you and the box. If you want to go all micro and quantum, it's your electron cloud and the box's electron cloud doing things to each other. Um, so there's always an interaction associated with a force. And when you draw a free body force diagram, you can sit down and think, what are the interactions on this object? And for each one of those interactions, you can then uh, draw a force. And you ha then that's how you identify all of the forces Assuming that you have found all of the interactions, and of course sometimes that's hard, there may be a, a force you don't know about that's that's happening. Um, maybe you haven't identified the nuclear strong force yet. Booga, booga, booga. Um, but whatever, assume that you're able to identify all of the interactions, and from all of those interactions you figure out what forces are acting on an object, and having done that, you um, uh, measure the acceleration of the object, and if um, Newton's second law holds, you know you're in an inertial frame, right? You All the forces that you have identified, you can identify the interaction for them, then you're in an inertial frame. Now, if you get to general relativity, you don't get to include gravity as an interaction anymore, because gravity is described entirely differently, but we're not in general relativity, so don't worry about that. Um, if you're in an accelerated reference frame, you will find F doesn't equal MA, that there seems to be an additional force or maybe additional forces acting on the object. Um, if, and what do I mean by the additional force? Well, your acceleration is not equal to the sum of all the forces you've identified from interactions divided by m. However, if you're in the accelerated reference frame, then um, it's no different than if that force were real. Right? You're in the accelerated reference frame, in that reference frame, you are going to move relative to the reference frame. You're going to accelerate relative to the reference frame as a result of this inertial force, which Taylor, Taylor calls it. So the difference between the, the forces that lots of people like to call real forces and what Taylor calls inertial forces and what lots of people call fictitious forces is that these inertial forces arise simply because you're in an accelerated reference frame. How do you know if you're in an accelerated reference frame? Your reference frame is accelerating relative to an inertial frame, but that begs the question, how do you know if you're in an inertial frame? Identify all the forces from interactions. Does Newton's first and second laws hold? If so, then good. So, all right, let's go back to general relativity again for a minute. Um, the, which, this will be relevant, even though this is not a general relativity course. Einstein's principle of equivalence is what general relativity is based on. When you do modern physics next year, or when you did modern physics last year, you learned that special relativity, or you will learn, that special relativity is entirely based on two fundamental assumptions. One, the laws of physics apply in any inertial frame. Two, the speed of light is one of those laws of physics. Very exciting. General relativity starts with uh, the principle of equivalence. And here's a slide that I used in the when I did a uh, lecture for the dramatic mathematics class. Einstein's principle of equivalence. There is no way to tell the difference between being in a gravitational field and being in an accelerated reference frame. So, to, uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, over here on the left, we have a dude dropping an apple. And he's on the surface of the Earth, so the apple accelerates towards the ground. It's gravity. It's traditional to use an apple for gravity experiments. It's historic, right? So from that guy's point of view, what do you see? Well, um, what does he see? He sees the apple accelerate towards the ground. Now, completely different guy. He's in deep intergalactic space. There's no gravity anywhere. But he's in a rocket. He's over on the right. And the rocket is accelerating um, what we will call upwards um, at 9.8 meters per second squared. 
let us start with the rocket at rest, but it's accelerating upwards. So he starts at rest. At that instant, the guy lets go of the apple. So at this point, in the inertial frame of deep intergalactic space, there are no forces on that apple. We're ignoring the gravity of the guy on the apple because it's very small. The apple's not touching anything, so there's nothing pushing on the apple. Um, so there's no forces on the apple because it started at rest, because the whole thing started at rest, it will stay at rest. But what does the guy do? Well, the guy is being pushed up by the box, by the rocket that he's in. So the guy is going to accelerate upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared, which means, pretty soon, the bottom of the box is going to catch up with the apple and hit it. From the guy's point of view, he will see the apple fall towards the bottom of the box what he calls the ground. What he sees is exactly the same as what the guy on the left sees. Everything that he measures will be identical to what the guy on the left measures, assuming a perfectly smooth rocket with perfect 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration uh, in the upwards direction. So if you're in a uniform gravitational field, you can't tell the difference between being in a uniformly accelerated reference frame. So the reference frames that section 9.1 talk about, these uniformly accelerated reference frames, if you call the inertial force a fictitious force, Einstein's principle of equivalence tells you you have to call gravity a fictitious force as well. And if you don't think gravity is real, well, I don't know how you're going to capture the moon. But so that's the sense in which these fictitious forces are real forces. In the frame of reference you're working on, it will cause things to accelerate relative to that frame of reference. Now, if you think about, but wait a minute, wouldn't I be able to tell I'm not being pulled down if I'm in that um, rocket? Think about it. how do you know that you're being pulled down? If Think about what you really feel. Stop and just think about where you are right now, standing or sitting. I'm sitting. Uh, in fact, I've got my feet up because this is what you do when classes are online. Be happy I'm not in my bathrobe. Um, what do I really feel? I feel a deep internal sadness. I feel despair about the nature of humankind. Um, but from a physical point of view, I feel the chair pushing on my butt. I feel the hassock pushing on my feet. I feel the arms of the chair pushing on my arms. I can feel that contact. Um, what I think of as me feeling gravity pulling down is really all of that pushing up on me. Um, if So you know the astronauts are sometimes called in free fall as they orbit around the Earth uh, because they are falling freely under the influence of gravity. Now, when you're in free fall, you feel your stomach go, whoop, oh no, I'm going to die. Um, turns out from the, uh, the, in a sense, that's a more natural way to be at least from a general relativity point of view. So the guy in the elevator on the right here is feeling the elevator push up on him, while the guy on the surface of the Earth on the left is feeling the surface of the Earth push up on him. And there's no experiment. Draw a box around the guy on the left, so he can't tell that he's on the Earth or in the thing. There's no experiment he could do to distinguish between the two. All right, so let's, um, let's actually do, uh, just think about the example of a horizontally accelerated train car. So I've just got a really simple animation here. Uh, what you've got is this big blue box. Hey, that's the train car. It's very exciting. And you see there's a little red ball at the top of it. We're going to start. I didn't put wheels on the train car. I'm sorry. We're going to start when this train car is at rest. Inertial frame, it's at rest. The frame of re We're in the frame of reference of the car. And we're going to release the ball from the top. And boo, blop. It falls down and hits the ground. Now that's very exciting. Um, what I didn't tell you, but you could have guessed was going to happen, is that in fact the train car was moving very smoothly to the right, not very fast, but it was moving and uh, there's a person on the right, there's glass walls on the side so the person on the right can see it. What does the what path does the ball actually fall as it as the train is moving to the right? Well, here we go. So what you notice was uh, the ball, if you look at it, it's still right in exactly the center of the floor of the train car is where it hit. But you can see the path that it fell is a parabola off to the right because it had some horizontal velocity attached to the ceiling of the train car. It had whatever the velocity of the train car to the right initially was. When it's released, there's no force in the horizontal direction, so it keeps that velocity. That's just the principle of inertia. Uh, and then it falls on a nice little parabola like that. But a person inside the train car would have just seen the initial thing of 
the ball just falling straight down. So both of those two things are consistent with each other. Well, now let's do another experiment. Instead of um, a constant moving train, we are going to uh, have the train move, accelerate to the right. And this will be really exciting. So we're going to start the train car moving to the right, just like last time, moving not very fast, but moving to the right. And we're also going to accelerate the train car. So this is just like the last video, except now the train car is accelerating. So the ball will start with some small horizontal velocity to the right, um, and it will go down at a parabola. There's no forces on the ball in the horizontal direction. There's gravity pulling down, but no forces horizontally. So the ball will just keep its horizontal velocity. But the train car is going to be accelerating. And so as we do that, you see the train car speeds up with time. And as a result, the ball hits the bottom of the train car to the left of the center of the train car. But it made a nice little parabola there. So the ball fell the way balls always fall. And it's just the train car was also accelerating. And so, sure, they just didn't line up together. That's no big deal. But now it gets really exciting if you look at this in the train's frame of reference. So here we are, a person inside the train. What would that person record? He would record the ball falling straight. Notice where it hits. It hits on the ground at the same spot relative to the train car where we saw last time. But notice it fell in a straight line. So what this person would conclude is that the net external force on the ball is down and to the left. If he can see outside and well then he sees the trees moving whatever if he knows that gravity is vertical for some reason or another he would conclude there must be another additional inertial force to the left on objects in this reference frame that's causing it to accelerate to the left or he might just say oh it looks like gravity is this way so that means i'm in a car that is is tilted um, it's tilted upwards at a little angle here and so when the ball falls straight down well of course it it's going to go towards the lower end, which is the left side of the train car when it falls. So that's what it would look like in the accelerated reference frame. And it's worth looking at both of these movies together um, at the same time. So you can compare the ball as viewed from the inertial frame and the ball as viewed from the accelerated frame at the same time. To get the dynamics right in the accelerated frame, you have to add an inertial force. And that inertial force is exactly equal to minus m a where m is the object the ball and a is the acceleration of the reference frame and notice this looks just like gravity remember mg is the strength of the force of gravity you multiply the mass by the gravitational field strength g here you multiply the mass by the acceleration of the reference frame and that suggests something subtle about gravity anyway uh, that's all for now i will record another video all about tidal forces specifically but this is just about accelerating reference frames mm -hmm.